The year is 1903. The Wright brothers take to the skies. You must do a podcast. Year by year, event by event. I'm afraid it is the only way to save humanity. Welcome to your own garage, Johnny, where I live. And welcome, listeners, to the Only History podcast where the hosts actually go back in time against their will at the behest of a celestial time being, and far from the only podcast to have a silly tacked on hook that we each pretend to bring home an item from the past. You'd think, Johnny, that going through the entire 20th century year by year in a time machine uh, would be enough of a hook. You would. It's certainly an advanced contraption. Um, this week's topic doesn't, I don't think, involve death, does it? Certainly not on a mass scale. Any deaths, Johnny? One of the brothers dies. I think Orville dies. Or is it Wilbur? I can just do, do this. <laughs> w- Wilbur dies. Orville dies. We'll find out, I'm sure. But we won't be going to his death directly, will we? Oh, we sort of prance around, I guess. We cover I it very, it's very defined. briefly. I, I don't think it's a yeah. bad death, though, is it? It's, it's just standard death. Yeah, I mean, they're all, they all die. Everyone dies. 2.0. Warm up the time machine. Right. Shall we? Okay, let's go. Please, milady. After you. Time flies. Go. Messrs. Wright brothers have successfully experimented with a balloonless airship at Kitty Hawk in Virginia. I love that. A balloonless airship. Perhaps what we call driverless cars today will one day have their own name. Just like that balloonless, balloonless airship became the aeroplane we know and love. Well, it was quite something. It was the first time that there was actually powered flight. People have been attempting to fly for goodness knows how long. But, yeah, this was the one that actually got off the ground, so to speak, in a powered way. In a powered way, um, in a machine heavier than the pilots. Was that the um, thing? It's a good thing we've got um, Tom Hopkins from the museum soon because i sense that neither of us know that much about this no i'm not so well versed in the history of flight i know a little bit more having actually done a <laughs> some cursory research and obviously everyone's heard of the wright brothers as the first flyers but definitely flight has a long and not so distinguished history before them because i think it's a sort of human urge to fly there, there's no one recording who the first person to fly was but i'm sure ever since really humans could look up they dreamed of flying so probably the very first person who jumped off a rock with great ambitions does that count as, fly, as flying i don't well, know it counts as, as the dream to fly oh the dream yeah 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 um, and it was only only really um the right brothers who actually lived the dream properly i think it's if a we little consider fly, flying as actually you know going somewhere rather than falling well yeah i mean definitely we do i think i don't think it's falling um and it feels a bit harsh on cavemen who i think would still have been highly evolved enough to know that they couldn't fly probably uh i don't know anything about that but uh that's my contrarian position there having a go at there would have been some darwinism going on any caveman who thought he could fly wouldn't be a caveman for very long. Oh, be yeah, that's true. A fossil and a fossil record. Like the, Can I give some the background? Bog, one of the bog men. One of the bog men, yes, indeed. With some feathers attached to him. <laughs> and no one quite knows why. And arms outstretched and broken at angles. <laughs> anyway, should I give some background I to those you... that actually don't know too much? about the Wright brothers and what they were getting up to in 1903. I know you're going to. I'm going to, yes. So, on December 17th, 1903, Orville Wright, was he the older or younger one? Can't remember. Never mind. We'll come back to it. Orville Wright piloted the first powered airplane 20 feet above a windswept beach in North Carolina. 
The flight only lasted 12 seconds and covered 120 feet. But three more flights were made that day, with Orville's brother Wilbur piloting the record flight, which lasted a very impressive 59 seconds and covered 852 feet. The flyer was quite an unruly machine. It didn't look too great either. Not what we would consider a traditional airplane these days. Uh, it was pitching up and down. The brothers were fighting with the controls. But they managed to keep it aloft. And they proved their theory uh, that humans could actually fly with a machine, with a powered engine strapped to it. Um, and the problems of flight were pretty much solved from that point on. It just kept getting better. Uh, but as Wilbur said, quite rightly, it, it is possible to fly without motors, but not without knowledge and skill. And so over a, over a thousand unpowered glides they'd taken before this from a place called Big Kill Devil Hill. Yes, I, and, I really love the name of Big Kill Devil Hill. I spotted that yesterday. It's, it's a great name. If you're <laughs> going to launch yourself from somewhere definitely do it from this hill um, before, uh, before i was going to ask as well you said when you say they're both at the controls what did you mean so without so without looking what did you mean so they sort of swapped between themselves it's not like they were both taking one stick each or one was controlling the wheel and the pedals i've actually no idea how they operated it well that's because that's this how plane I thought, certainly wouldn't that's how i thought it was johnny from reading initially <laughs> And then I oh, am, really? but apparently really? their father, they promised their father when they started their experiments that they'd never both be in the same plane at the same time in case it crashed. Um, so that's um, apparent. I mean, it, it makes logical sense anyway, and I, I assume it's a one-man plane, but um, I, I thought that was quite interesting. It was a promise to their father so that they wouldn't both die in a terrible plane crash. Makes sense, really. Because if you're a father, you're going to be quite worried when your children come up with the idea of launching a plane into the air. And uh, Wilbur was the elder brother who also was died, okay. died, died, actually predeceased his younger brother, died of typhoid. I, I'm looking at a picture of them. One has an elegant moustache, one has no moustache, clean shaven and a receding hairline. Do you know which one is which? Yes, um, Orville is the one with the moustache and the receding, and Wilbur is looking very bald in the picture I'm looking at in 1905. They were nicknamed the Bishop's Boys. Why is that? Were they religious? They, the, I think their dad was religious. Hang on, I was about to say because their dad was a bishop. Must be that, right? Let's have a let's have a check. He's a clerk. It was a clergy. I remember man. reading something that that their their dad was into into the christianity um, um yeah he's probably everyone it, was religious back then anyway so but he, yeah he was a clergyman of english and dutch ancestry um and milton Wright, that, that's his that's the father's name his mum was descended from the vanderbilts mm -mm. the brothers never okay. married interesting no they definitely I'm had a, a bromance Wikipedia. going on there uh oh what did you say a bromance well Nothing untoward. But How they, do they you were know? Were you there? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a stretch to suggest that they were incestuous lovers, uh, but they were very, they were very close, as brothers sometimes are. <laughs> so close, in fact, that when one of them died, I'll have to come back to tell you which one. But I, the other I, was I, very I, upset. I, I told you which one just now. It's Wilbur died in, of typhoid in 1912. He was only 45 years old. Yes, exactly. And Orville was very distressed by this. He never really flew again after it. He sort of lost the passion. Because you can imagine, these boys, they were growing up together, and it was their dream. I remember mm. that, uh, from the research that I did that they were given a toy... Sort of helicopter sort of wound up by rubber bands and everything yes. and this sparked their imagination this this was the push that they needed to aspire to great things so even from when they were little boys playing with their um, little toy helicopter yeah they, they wanted this really badly um i i read i think i read the same uh source as you it's a toy helicopter uh, it, it wouldn't have been called a toy helicopter, would it? Again, at the at the uh, at the time, I'm becoming again obsessed with the kind of semantics of language, 
Um, the the the, uh, the article that I'm looking at now, for example, describes the Wright brothers' uh, machine as an immense kite with propellers and steering apparatus. So that's what it was. It's a balloonless airship. It is an immense kite, and that toy helicopter would have been called something like a Whirlaba gig, a Whirlaba gigum, probably. I think it was actually. Da Vinci, Leonardo da Vinci, who came up with the first designs for a helicopter, but as you say, it wasn't mm. called a helicopter. Well, maybe it was. Yeah, but... I'm just making all of this up, Johnny. Um, that's what you want from a history podcast. So, um, did he? Let's. I'm gonna. I'm gonna look that up. You carry on. Um, you carry on. Well, it's interesting. You say it's like a kite because if you look at the design of it, it does look very, very kite-like, like one of those box kites. It's got these two big wings and just fabric stretched across it yeah and and yeah the engine and the propellers at the back and from the looks of it it looks like the pilot is actually almost lying down on it lying prone yeah hear it I so think, it, it were, probably were they quite on terrifying f- lying on their front were they yeah yeah from the pictures again yeah. i can see there's, there's a famous picture of it taking off uh, just a few feet above the ground and the pilot is very much lying down on it. Um, totally terrifying. It would have been so dangerous. And, uh, like, as you say, they could only keep it off the ground for, like, 12 seconds at a time. before, And then it was never a controlled landing, I don't think. it. Like, it literally would crash each time. It was just about, pull it, you know, kind of going with it so it didn't get completely smashed up, although it did get quite damaged. Um, I, I think we... We now are so accustomed to flying that all fear of it has been lost. Well, for most people, um, obviously, when you hit a bit of turbulence Oof. or something, uh, you might you might feel that nasty yeah, sensation. Yeah, mine's, mine's in the strangely stomach. got worse over the years. It's fine as a kid. Right. Now I get very nervous. Um, but do carry on. Well, generally, people, it's an everyday thing now. You go to the airport, you get on the plane. Yeah, it's for you. Well, you never stop flying. You're, you're always in the. Your air miles must be the envy of all, Johnny. Well, I think my carbon footprint will, will certainly not be as good yeah. as it should be. Well, with carry all on. The flights that I've been taking. But I'm just saying it's a very, very normal thing now to go to the airport to get in a plane. Uh, be up at 35,000 feet and then down again. And it's almost like getting on a bus or a train. There's no big deal. But back then... It would have literally scared the shit out of you. You would have had no no way of knowing whether you were going to make it uh, out of it in one piece or not. Particularly if you're lying down, strapped in, just a few feet over the ground, going pretty quickly as well, uh, off a terrifying named hill as well. So I've it, got a lot of respect. What's it called them. again? I'm kill, kill, you. devil hill, kill hill. Kill, devil hill. Big kill, devil Big hill. Big devil hill. It's quite a tongue twister. Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, Orville and Wilbur throwing themselves off Big Kill, Devil Hill so that we may now fly in sort of the peace and relative comfort that we know today. Much that once was is lost. We are time tripping. For I can see what is to come. We, we are time tripping high. Much that once was is lost. Go back, go back, learn the lessons. It is the only way to avoid catastrophe. Although, I really find um, it remarkable. I, I, although I guess there's a, a, a long journey from that first flight to the flights today that's something we'll be able to um pull out of tom hopkins when we talk to him i was gonna say this is what i find remarkable it's not actually that long ago the progress is staggering if you think about it 1903 that's what 122 years ago yeah when they first started soaring and then 66 years later in 1969 you're sending someone to the moon so Allegedly. It's almost mind-blowing how much progress you're making. Yeah. That's the, the and, why, why you've yeah, the, the Wright thing. brothers, The Wright brothers really were absolute pioneers here. They invented something incredibly cool. Well, maybe not invented, but they, they mastered the invention. They did, and, uh, for, and looking at it, like it, it, you, start, you get this very strange 
legacy out of it like the whole thing about the first what's what was the damn thing called the right flyer that was called the first contraption mm. it, it wasn't the best name really not the most catchy name um, just south of Kitty Hawk in North Carolina. But um, I was going to quickly say, before I continue on this point, uh, you were right, Johnny, the word helicopter was coined in 1861 by Gustave Ponton Demacour. So that would have been a word. So naughty me, a little smack on, okay. the, on the wrist. On um, the wrist. But what I do, what's so interesting about the Wright brothers, I think, is the, is the sort of legacy of it. Um, because you've obviously got lots of people competing to um, for the first flight and then for, for better and higher flights. And a little later on, even in America, the Wright brothers are kind of seen as a bit like, um, the, who, I can't remember who it is, whoever, the head of the Smithsonian refused the Wright flyer to put on display because he was a mate of some other flight guy who he thought deserved more credit. So he said, no, we don't want the Wright Flyer in the Smithsonian. So the Wright brothers felt snubbed and actually um, brought it to London instead. So it, it was in the Science Museum until after the Second World War when the Americans had sort of realised that, that they owed the rights. There's also a real problem which affects America as um, sort of being a pioneer of flight among nations, which is copyright law. Um, so the, the Wright brothers were really good at copywriting and patenting their sort of invent, uh, inventions. There's all sorts of reading one can do on that, and I'm sure Tom will have something to say. Um, but the effect it had was a bit of a chilling effect on like um, entrepreneurism and pioneering of aviation, so that by the time of the First World War, because the Wright patents are so strong and numerous and they're so litigious, um, I think America only has like 14 pilots and like only like a tiny amount of American made um, aircraft. So the Europeans, although they might not have been first to the, uh, the first flights, um, really take, take it from there. So it's quite interesting to see how intellectual property stuff can have a, a bit of an adverse effect. Indeed. Yeah, I saw the article that said they were patent trolls. And it's quite interesting. What is a patent troll? Yeah, but I need I to read that more, article now. More or less what you were saying, like someone who who refuses to let anyone else have any degree of sort of liberty with their invention. And yeah. they're always blocking you and making sure that you can't use their inventions without giving full credit or... And you can see, you, you can see why. I mean, it took them, by the looks of it, a good like eight years at least to to stop like the French calling them bluffers and frauds, and they had, they had to go and do more demonstrations in France. Obviously, there's no Sky News or TikTok in those days, um, so uh, proving that something happened probably um, quite a lot more tricky. Mm. I think this is where the whole debate about who was responsible for the first powered flight comes from it's because a lot of people were just hobbyists at this time sort of very much uh, like the mad inventor style yeah. people with their fabulous flying machines and the only way that you could prove it at this time as you say you've not got any um or you've not got easy access to photography or record keeping so you really have to invite a journalist around and I think probably the rights were quite good at this. They got a journalist prepared and lined up and ready to report on it. Well, some of the other guys, the hobbyist mad inventors, they may have done it, but if you didn't record it, yeah. I'm sorry. That's it. That's the way of the world. I bet if it was today that it was happening, uh, the Wright brothers would have gone on Twitter, seen that 10 other people had the same idea anyway, and just thought, oh, fuck it, someone else would probably have done it soon. That's what Indeed. they, I mean, that's what I, that's how I do it. Let's go right back and think of the first, um, the first flight legends and myths. Obviously, we've, we've had our speculation that it was cavemen who first attempted flying, but... No real written proof of that, not even any cave paintings that we know of, of a man covered in feathers. So what do you think was the first recorded 
um, myth or legend of flying? Do you have any ideas? I do have a strong idea. I think it's, prob- on, it's probably Icarus. Um, I do mm. know. I do know about Icarus a little bit. I did Google oh. first flight legends myths, though. Let's tell us a bit about Icarus. Uh, Icarus is the myth of the man who f- flew too close to the sun. He um, he made wax wings, and he wanted to fly. Yeah, can't remember why. Something to do with Daedalus, according to Googs. Um, but okay. obviously, it's a, it's a fable, you know. Don't fly too close to the sun, or your wax wings may melt, and you may fall to your death. Indeed. Um, so Indeed. that was the well, first you, flight, you, unless you count you God. You credit Icarus with this, sir. You credit Icarus when it was actually his father, Daedalus, who was the inventor. Icarus was just along for the ride, so to speak. Yeah. Because I'll, I'll fill in the gaps here. Daedalus was, a, again, this master inventor, and King Minos of Crete, he captured Daedalus and his son and said, Daedalus, you will build me a maze for my Minotaur. It's the Minotaur, this half bull, half human creature that was terrifying yeah. the island of Crete uh, and needed to be locked in a maze or a labyrinth. So Daedalus designed the maze, and even when he designed it, the king... King Minos, he wouldn't let him go. So Daedalus, being such a great inventor, he thought, well, I'll just fly my way out of my prison. So he built himself these wings, as you say, with wax, probably some waxy uh, framework over some wood and feathers stuck on. And him and Icarus, they launched themselves off into the sky. And Icarus, he was overjoyed because he was flying. It's amazing. It's a dream. But he took it too far. He flew too high. And as you say, the sun burned his, uh, melted his wax and he plummeted into the sea. And I think Daedalus just sort of flapped his way, sadly, to freedom. Gained his freedom, lost his son. Mine was more succinct. Um, yes, true. But, true. Um... but can you spot the whiff of bullshit in this story? Tell me, why does this story not stand up to scrutiny? Um... I mean, it's a myth, isn't it? It's uh, representative of, you know, don't fly too close to the sun, the Tower of Babel, that sort of thing. I don't think you're asking me, you, you didn't want that answer. Why is it what you asked me it was? Why? I did some thinking on this, and Uh-oh. I don't believe this myth, because the higher you fly, the colder it gets. <laughs> oh, that's the angle you were coming from. <laughs> so actually, if anything... Icarus would have frozen. The wax wouldn't have melted. He'd have had to fly halfway to Mercury for that to happen. You're right. I mean, you're right. <laughs> um, it's a good myth. So we can we can discount Icarus and Daedalus as being the first people to fly. Just a myth. We can. <laughs> it's, a it's a myth. Yeah. We can definitely uh, discount. <laughs> Repeats itself, repeats itself. First as a tragedy, then as a farce. Repeats itself. Repeats itself. Another myth I like uh, for first flight, Pegasus. Oh, yeah. The old winged horse. I can't remember who was riding him. I think a Greek hero or Greek yes. figure called Bellerophon. Oh. And, and yeah. Of I, course. I, I, I've got, I hold um, no credence with winged horses, so I'm discounting them too. Well, I only know the sort of the Harry House and Clash of the Titans canon, where I think it's Perseus who rides Pegasus. Maybe it's okay. right. Uh, have you seen that with all the stop motion? No. What? You've never seen Clash of the Titans, the original? Mm, maybe. All right, hang on. I'd have to jog my memory. Well, I'm going to jog it now because this is really important. I thought you were talking about a Marvel spin-off. No, but of course, all of this stuff um, very influential on on that stuff. Like you'll anyway, be- yeah. You'll believe a horse can fly. Click on that. Oh, it's, it's really That's beautiful. It. Who's the old man? Oh, wow, look here, I see it coming in. Yeah, have you not it's seen it? It's pretty well done, isn't it? No, I've not seen it. Oh, it's great. There's loads of, there's like the, the Krakens in it, Medusa. Anyway, sorry. 
Um, you were anyway, saying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so Pegasus, uh, don't like that as a as the first flight. Um, but yeah, the Greeks they had quite a lot of these myths about humans flying or gods flying. There was the messenger with his winged sandals. Oh yeah, Hermes. Hermes, I think you're right. Yeah, Hermes. He was had an interesting take on how to fly, just these saddles with little wings at the back that could sort of propel you up into the air. Um, yeah, they still one I do been like invented. from the classical times, another myth, is King Kaj Karus of Persia. Do you know what he did to get airborne? No. <laughs> You're going to like this. He attached eagles to his throne and flew around his kingdom. <laughs> no, he didn't. No, he didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so say you. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, we can discount the myths and legends because obviously yeah. they are nonsense. Yeah, yeah. But they're fun. They 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 show the idea that humans from way back when they were had this. I, I don't I don't fire. think that um, Wilbur and Orville Wright's lawyers would have been troubled by these these earlier claims to the first flight that that you've described. No. We we briefly mentioned Leonardo da Vinci and his diagrams around this time people were thinking about flying at least and putting that thought into practice what they were often doing was they were doing sort of like an icarus and daedalus style contraption uh, making wings big flappy wings and throwing themselves off towers because it's around this time that you get the really big cathedrals being put up Oh yeah! Before this, you, you haven't really had these monolithic structures, so it didn't take too long before some intrepid individuals would climb to the top of the tower, and there was just the urge to throw yourself off. God, see, yeah, I get that. Down. There still is to this day. I mean, not to throw myself off, but you know, you, I, I get that. I get that urge. Seventeen seventy. Uh, one of my favourites. There was this uh, French clergyman called. Pierre de Forge, hmm. and he was imprisoned uh, for, for a year in the Bastille, and it's around this time that he develops an obsession with flying. So, again, it's sort of it's linked to the of that. Uh, being imprisoned. Uh, but anyway, he, he constructed a pair of wings and uh, convinced uh, a peasant to try them out. He didn't want to try them out himself. They, they were just, again, this classic <laughs> flappy wings strapped to the hands. And he ordered this peasant up to the to the church tower, up to the top of the belfry, and said, jump off, assuring him that his wings would work and that God would look after him. Uh, unfortunately, the peasant absolutely bottled it and didn't do it. Um, so... You can't get the staff. <laughs> you can't get the staff. But this wasn't to deter him, uh, because De Forge actually plucked up the courage to do it himself a few years later. Um, so he climbed to the top of another tower. Uh, predictable results. He sort of flapped a bit and then plummeted down uh, and somehow suffered no more than a broken arm. Another one called Besnier the Locksmith, 1678. He had a little bit more sense than... Uh, than the Pierre de Forge, and he realised that he didn't have the right materials to build a flying machine. So he designed a sort of apparatus, and it was, according to some sketches that we have of his, two wooden rods which were placed over the shoulder and attached weird little wings. Uh, they were tied to the pilot's feet, and he would flap his hands, flap his feet, <laughs> and <laughs> try to get airborne like this. Uh, he wasn't quite as brave as Pierre de Forge because he never launched himself from a high platform, but he would be seen around this village, like, running around in this contraption, throwing himself off small heights, like a table, Blimey. or <laughs> like a low house, and flapping around, or even just to perfect his technique, going around the village in in his contraption, flapping and <laughs> desperately wanting to get airborne. Oh, I really, I really empathise with him. <laughs> I just really do. You know, it's worth pointing out that Will and Orv uh, didn't patent, like, the, the, the first flying machine, but rather, to quote 
a system of aerodynamic control that manipulated a flying machine's surfaces. And I think that's the key difference between them and uh, the flappy arms man, for example, to use a very extreme example. Indeed, indeed. They actually put a lot of work into researching it, and they were real theoreticians of flight as well. They didn't just uh, build it and hope for the best. They were really trying to study every angle. I don't really feel moved to look anything up if I don't know it, because I figure we'll just, like, we can just ask Tom all the questions that <laughs> we can't yeah, stop to look yeah, up. So we've got uh, an expert <laughs> coming on. Or well, I say an expert, as expert as we could get at the moment. No, he is an expert. You can't. He works for so a proper museum. We don't. True. A flying museum, no less. Not yes, you, any museum. It, it can change locations. Airship. Mm-hmm. Well, there you go, yes. So, it, humans were having trouble really conceiving of flying without a sort of balloon-like structure, like a Zeppelin style. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the, the state of the art was really pushed forward uh, at the end of the century, um, end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. People were coming up with this new conception, uh, partly as a result of the steam engine, people once the steam engine was put in people began to think can we power flight this way uh, obviously a steam engine would never work because it was really just ridiculously heavy so it did require a little bit of progress in engines as well yeah. before wilbur and orville could could get there anyone who's used a just a standard sized balloon will know that they're a bloody liability so um i think people were quite keen to get rid of them especially post uh, hindenburg and all that uh, moving on a few it's 20 true. years or so there but well, you've been going back to like icarus so, today yeah so yeah you're usually yes, we've, we've been traveling around a bit the history of flight um do you no, know who good. who the first passengers in a balloon were and i'll give you a clue they weren't human mm. so there was a sheep a rooster and a duck were the first passengers in a balloon uh, a it took them to a height of about six thousand feet and traveled more than one mile then no what? record of what happened to this. Yeah, I was going to say, up. what happened to we'll, we'll have to ask Tom. Um... <laughs> put poor Tom, on the, Tom, who's like he, hugely knowledgeable, and we're going to put him on the spot and I'll ask him what happened to the sheep in the first sheep-flown balloon. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if Wilbur and Orville had any prototypes that they maybe put a little mouse in, or, as you say, a rat. They're often animals that you use for experiments. I doubt it. The, they're, there's I, something focused about them, and I think there was no need for them to put a rat mm, in. I mm. then that will do some research and find that they actually murdered endless rats. <laughs> they killed Devil Hill. Hurry, time trippers. Finish your mission and return for your debrief. Yeah, that, that was fun i like that it really puts a, a new spin on going to the airport now whenever i fly i've got more of an appreciation i bet you have old jet set johnny with your air miles what do you bring back what first sort of fascinated orville and wilbur with flight it was this little toy helicopter contraption that was designed uh, by a chap called alphonse penord and was given to them by their father milton and it was this one thing that made like the real impression on them to begin with. I think that's just a lovely, lovely choice. And I'm almost moved to tears. What, what did you choose? Did you get anything good? I brought back uh, the patent for the Wright Flyer. I now own the, the patent. I don't understand patent law well enough to know how to exploit this, but we can put it in your bathroom, for example. I wonder if you can make any money out of the, the Wright Brothers patent. Imperial euphoria, death of Queen Victoria.